Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar entitled Delivery of Cell, RNA, and DNA Therapeutics, Surveying the IP and Business Landscape. Before we get started on today's presentation, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. For those of you that may have questions about any of today's topics, we invite you to type them into the Q&A widget on the left-hand side of your screen at any time. We will do our best to answer all questions at the conclusion of today's presentation, time permitting. However, if we do not get to all of your questions today, we will be sure to follow up with you via email. If you experience any technical difficulties with the webinar platform, please refresh your browser or see the webcast help guide on your screen, which is designated with a question mark icon. A copy of today's slides are available to download in the resource list widget. The recorded version of this presentation will be distributed to all registrants post event. For those of you who are seeking CLE credit today, please enter the CLE code when it is announced later on in the presentation. Note that if you are seeking Kansas, New York, or New Jersey CLE credit, you must also fill out the attorney affirmation form, which is located in the resource list widget. CLE certificates of attendance will be distributed to eligible participants approximately eight weeks after the webinar via email. And as a final note, a short survey will appear on your screen. We would appreciate it if you provided us with feedback on today's presentation. And now I will hand it over to TR to kick off the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Tian Ran Yan. I am a partner with Foley and Lerner. Uh, in addition to myself, uh, the presenters today include uh, Steve Mabius, uh, Sean Mira, and Jenny Jen. Uh, I want to give a brief introduction of our presenters. Um, Mr. Steve Mabius is a partner and IP lawyer with Foley. Uh, Steve has over 25 years of experience providing strategic counseling to life sciences companies relating to all aspects of intellectual property. And he previously served as chair of Foley's IP department. Uh, Steve graduated from Cornell University and the George Washington University Law School. Prior to become a lawyer, he was a patent examiner with the US Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, Steve will discuss packaging and delivery of RNA DNA therapeutics in today's presentation. Uh, Mr. Sean Mira is a hedge fund investor based in San Francisco and focused on healthcare investment. Uh, he leverages finance, medicine, and statistics to identify and fund industry-leading public biotechnology companies pursuing development and commercialization of therapeutics. Sean is a member of the American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy and the American Academy of Neurology. Sean has previous experience across venture capital, private equity, and investment banking in healthcare and technology sector. He holds degrees in business from Wharton School and biomedical engineering from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Sean will be discussing delivery developments and next steps in today's presentation. Uh, Jen, Ms. Jenny Jen is a patent agent with Foley and Lardner. She is a member of Foley's mechanical and electromechanical technology practice. Jenny graduated from MIT with a bachelor's degree in material science, and she also earned a master's degree in material science and engineering from Stanford. And Jenny will be discussing delivery and encapsula encapsulation of cells in today's presentation. Uh, lastly, my name is Tianran Yan. I am a partner and IP lawyer with Foley. Uh, my practice focuses on assisting clients with global IP strategies, including patent prosecution, counseling, uh, IP due diligence investigation, and post-grant proceedings. I currently serve as, as the vice chair of the chemical, biotechnology, and pharmaceutical practice at Foley. And I will be discussing viral actors uh, in today's presentation. With that introduction, I will turn it over to Sean to uh, start the presentation. Thanks, TR, for that kind introduction. Uh, I'd also like to thank the broader Foley team for inviting me to be part of this uh, exciting discussion today. I'll be providing an overview of the business landscape and recent updates in the technology um, for delivery of genetic medicines. Next slide. There we go. 
So a, a lot of uh, very important innovation is taking place in the space over the last several years and few decades. We now have uh, a number of important and versatile technologies at our fingertips that allow us to uh, modify the genome and expression profile for, for patients in need. Uh, we can uh, replace or edit uh, missing genes that are necessary for proper functioning of, of the human body using gene therapy, gene editing, and mRNA technology. We can also silence or knock down overexpressed uh, unhealthy genes using RNAi uh, or RNA interference and ASO technologies. We can even um, address improper splicing mutations um, or reintroduce uh, cells into the body um, across DNA, RNA, and cell therapies. I'll be speaking more about each of these technologies over the course of the next few minutes. So as with many technological innovations, the obstacle can be the way, uh, as is the case here. So about uh, 20 years back in 1999, there was an unfortunate case of a patient who died after taking an adenovirus gene therapy in a trial. Since that time, we, we've come to learn a lot more about what the appropriate dose of gene therapy or, or viral material um, can be. We've also learned more about things like pre-existing antibodies and how these um, may drive the immunogenic responses that we saw uh, in that 1999 case. So since then, scientists have advanced the adeno-associated virus, which is a less immunogenic alternative to prior viruses tested in the clinic um, and has become the payload of choice for modern gene therapy today. The AV, as it's called, uh, is even used in the two approved therapies on the market today, Solgensma and Luxterna. The RNA interference or RNA silencing technology has followed a, a similar trajectory, albeit more recent. In 2016, um, there was a clinical trial where 18 patients unfortunately passed away after taking a drug called Rebusaran. Uh, since that time, we've come to understand more about uh, what it takes to deliver lower dose RNAi uh, that's more potent and still achieves the intended therapeutic uh, effect. For example, the Galnac conjugate is an important advancement. Uh, this conjugate is bound to the RNAi and allows for it to uh, get into the liver with greater specificity with less RNAi drug uh, getting to other background organs and potentially causing damage. Um, we also have the phosphorothioate uh, modification. This is the substitution of an oxygen for a sulfur in the RNAi backbone um, that provides greater protection for the drug uh, against the, the body's exonucleases or enzymes that may break it down. Moving over to mRNA or messenger RNA technology, this is very exciting and an important one. Uh, many will recognize it as it's the basis of two of the approved uh, vaccines that we have for COVID-19. Uh, mRNA as a molecule is actually too large to be encapsulated into the small AV viral capsid. It's also too large to be uh, delivered naked like the RNAi uh, is into the body. So scientists have proposed and, and brought forward the lipid nanoparticle, or LNP, as the solution to, to the mRNA delivery problem. Uh, and it's actually uh, an interesting biochemical uh, problem that they've solved where an effective LNP has to remain intact uh, as it's injected into the bloodstream and makes its way over to the, the target cell, but then has to turn around and uh, release its contents um, once it gets into the cell. And, and so this problem has been solved in the last few years um, with uh, cationic amino lipid heads that are bound to the LNP or are part of the LNP um, that can that have the right biochemical properties, charge, et cetera, that allow it to effectively deliver and achieve uh, endosome escape. Cell therapy is another important application of genetic medicine technology. Um, CAR-T are the approved therapies that we have for uh, actually addressing liquid tumors, such as lymphoma, leukemia, and myeloma. Um, these are cells that are extracted from a, the patient, modified in such a way to induce greater tumor killing, and then injected back. 
uh, to achieve that therapeutic effect. Th these have uh, been important to date. However, there are limitations of, of what we call autologous CAR-Ts as, as the approved therapies are. Essentially, taking cells from a sick cancer patient um, may not be the, the optimal uh, cell source for, for, for a drug. And further, the process of extracting, modifying, and shipping back the cells can take uh, on the order of, of weeks. And, and this can be a long time when we're talking about uh, uh, rapidly progressing cancers. And so the next wave of innovation here will be allogeneic CAR-T uh, or off-the-shelf CAR-T. This is essentially uh, the extraction of uh, T cells from a healthy donor, uh, moving those through a greater number of modifications to reduce the risk of immune responses like graft versus host disease, and then injecting those back into the patient, uh, or rather injecting those into the patients in need. Um, and because these are uh, removed from healthy donors and, and treated ahead of time, they can be injected in real time, which is important. Uh, beyond that, the application of cell therapy in solid tumors will be very important. Solid tumors comprise 90% uh, of all cancers where liquid tumors are, are the minority. And so this will be an important application uh, of the technology as well. And we may actually be on the cusp of seeing the first tumor infiltrating lymphocytes um, reviewed by the FDA here in the next uh, several months. This slide highlights a number of the high value acquisitions and public offerings that have taken place um, across the space in the last several years. Uh, really highlights to me the uh, great level of investor interest and innovation that has taken place in the space. Uh, one positive example that I'll highlight is the messenger RNA class. These uh, public offerings that took place only two or three years ago for Moderna and BioNTech have seen the values of these companies rise uh, greater than 10 times um, on the heels of the very successful and rapid development of mRNA vaccines for COVID-19. I wanna comment on a few uh, setbacks that have taken place uh, in the last one, one or two years. Despite all of the great work and advancements that have taken place um, over the last uh, few decades, we're still uh, at the frontiers of, of learning how genetic materials and genetic medicine uh, interacts with, with the human body. So there's a lot on this page. I'll just comment on three specific examples. Um, the, for one, the delivery of genetic medicine to skeletal muscle is very challenging. Given the high level of surface area that the skeletal muscle comprises in the body, uh, we need to deliver a very high dose of genetic material uh, in order to transduce enough muscle to achieve the intended therapeutic effect. And so in a number of recent AAV gene therapies, there have been uh, gene therapy trials, there have been some setbacks. Uh, we saw three patients unfortunately pass away last year in a study for a rare um, myotubular myopathy. These patients passed away of liver toxicity. Um, and we've also seen two other trials for muscular dystrophies report immune-mediated uh, kidney injury and thrombocytopenia. So it seems that these high doses of gene therapy are getting to um, off-target organs and potentially causing complications. A second example, uh, in contrast to the high dose, is the eye, where a very uh, low dose of gene therapy can be delivered um, uh, directly into the eye. Uh, just a few weeks ago, there was a um, rather surprising case of severe inflammation that led to blindness reported in a patient in an AV gene therapy trial for, for an eye disease, diabetic uh, macular edema. Um, this is unlikely to be a, a broad uh, issue for, for eye-directed gene therapy, given we already have an approved, uh, approved therapy called Luxterna. However, Luxterna is deliver, delivered subretinally, whereas the gene therapy that reported the blindness case is uh, delivered intravitreally, uh, and so it may just be a case of inappropriate delivery method. But we're learning more as time goes on, given this is, is quite a recent um, occurrence. 
The third example would be uh, over in, in the liver, speaking about a specific uh, RNAi or RNA interference technology or, or drug called Inclisaran or Lecvio. This is a uh, anti-PCSK9 developed for cholesterol lowering, and it represents a very important potential inflection point for the space. Uh, previously, all of the approved gene and RNA technologies uh, have been uh, focused on smaller, rare orphan indications uh, where the uh, number of patients in the developed world might be on the order of thousands or tens of thousands. Uh, this, this drug has the potential as a cholesterol lowering drug to address a uh, population of hundreds of thousands or even millions um, of patients. And so uh, we have seen that drug just get approved by the European Union and uh, the FDA on the first go around rejected it. Uh, so it'll be a matter of uh, maybe uh, on the order of another year before we hear back from whether this uh, this drug can move forward in the U.S. and, and it obviously represents a very important uh, advancement. Speaking about the the recent setbacks offers a good segue to what are the opportunities ahead in the space, and and there are many significant ones. Um, of course, being able to deliver safely and effectively to more tissues beyond just the liver, um, meaning the brain, the muscle, lung, and so forth. We also need to uh, expand beyond just rare and orphan diseases, albeit those are very, very important, um, to larger and, and non-monogenic diseases to really unlock the full potential of, of genetic medicine. Uh, this will require not only a, a greater focus on, on safety, um, but also a big push on the manufacturing front. The uh, requirements to produce this complex biologic uh, material, whether it be gene therapy or RNAi, um, does take a lot of uh, effort, cost, time. And we're not quite there yet, at, at least speaking about AV gene therapy specifically, uh, not quite yet there to uh, support the production of, of millions of doses. Another question that, that we need to address is how durable really are these technologies, uh, given we're in the, the first few years of observing patients who have taken uh, one and done type therapies. We're still learning how durable the, the effect actually is. Um, and so it'll be important to continue monitoring, monitoring this, uh, also um, evaluating options for redosing for gene therapy or, or longer dose intervals for RNAi and so forth. And then uh, overall, it's definitely important for the sponsors in the field, the industry, to continue aligning with uh, international regulatory agencies to understand evolving uh, regulatory requirements. Uh, I, again, it can be it can take a lot to uh, advance these these products and and uh, master the the process uh, manufacturing process as well. So we have, uh, you know, work to do to continue advancing um, these medicines, uh, but we've also made a lot of strides and progress towards uh, leveraging the genetic revolution to bring life-improving and life-saving drugs to patients in need. Thank you for your attention, and I'll turn the call over to Jenny Zhang to speak about cell therapy in more detail. Thank you, Sean. Today, I'll be talking about the IP landscape of delivery and encapsulation of cells. As a brief overview, cell-based therapy consists of treating diseases by delivering or implanting living cells into a patient. Cell-based therapy delivers complex living entities capable of modulating their functions and responding to their environment. This stands in contrast to small molecule drugs and biologics, such as engineered proteins and antibodies, which are the predominant treatment methods for most diseases. Today, I will be discussing the IP landscape of direct delivery of cells into the body and encapsulation packages for whole cells. There are other examples of cell-based therapies, which I will not be covering, such as seeding cells into biodegradable scaffolds. What I am calling direct cell therapy includes the direct delivery of cells into the body, such as through an intravenous infusion. Encapsulation packages for cells can be divided into micro-encapsulation and macro-encapsulation. Micro-encapsulation is where individual cells are enveloped in a micron-scale immunoisolating membrane. 
while macro encapsulation is where groups of cells are housed in a device that is actually implanted into the body. So first I will discuss direct cell therapies. There are a number of advantages of direct cell therapies. For example, they can be effective where conventional treatments have failed. Another advantage is that the treatment and recovery times can be shorter compared to those of conventional treatments, such as chemotherapy. The challenges within the field of direct cell therapies include avoiding a negative immune response from the body, as well as safe and effective delivery of the cells. There's the potential for cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity, as well as unknown long-term effects. With regards to successes in the field, an active area of direct cell therapies is within the realm of immunotherapy. As Sean mentioned, a type of immunotherapy known as CAR T cell therapy has had success in the treatment of certain cancers. CAR T cells or chimeric antigen receptor cells have been genetically engineered to produce uh, T cell receptors that recognize, target, and destroy cancer cells. In autologous treatments, the CAR T cells are manufactured from the patient's own blood while in allogeneic treatments, the CAR T cells are manufactured from the blood of a healthy donor. Yaskarta, uh, Kimraya, and Takardis, as Sean mentioned, are uh, autologous CAR T cell therapies that have received FDA approval and are currently used for uh, treatments. While there are currently no FDA approved uh, allogeneic CAR T cell therapies, uh, allogeneic CAR T cell therapy has attracted significant attention for its potential to overcome the limitations of autologous CAR T cell therapies. So moving on to the patent landscape, IP protection of direct cell therapies has received increased attention, particularly with regards to CAR T cell therapies. As you can see, the top 10 publication years for CAR T cell therapies occurred in the last half decade and in the 1980s. Since the first chimeric receptors containing portions of an antibody and the T cell receptor were described in the 80s, the patent publications for this technology have uh, exploded in the last five or six years with the rise of autologous and allogeneic CAR T cell therapies. So I wanted to focus in on a claiming strategy that I have not yet seen a lot of in the CAR T cell therapy arena. So while it is common to claim a method of treatment comprising administering CAR T cells with a certain variable region or methods of intravenously administering the CAR T cells to a human, I found an interesting strategy here um, employed by Allogene Therapeutics. This is a US patent application directed to methods and compositions for dosing of allogeneic CAR T cells. While this is still a pending patent application, a very similar claim was recently granted for a corresponding case in a foreign jurisdiction. So this is a nice example of claiming an article of manufacture that includes sealable containers that uh, hold a specified dose of allogeneic CAR T cells. The art article includes packaging material and a label that has instructions for administering the doses to a subject. The key here is that this claim is agnostic to the specific nature of the allogeneic CAR T cells. Instead, it focuses on the container that holds the CAR T cells. So now I will discuss cell encapsulation technology. As a recap, the idea of cell encapsulation is to compartmentalize cells within a protected environment in order to promote long-term viability and functioning, for example, as an artificial organ. The advantages of cell encapsulation include the real-time and unobstructed release of therapeutic agents, such as hormones or enzymes, in response to external biological stimuli. Cell encapsulation allows for biologically active molecules to be dosed in precise amounts and when needed. The challenges within the field of cell encapsulation are similar to those of direct cell therapies. However, they also include biocompatibility of an implanted device, as well as packaging considerations, such as refilling and replacing the device. With regards to examples in the field, Encapsule Life is conducting preclinical testing of microcapsules containing islet cells. Viasite uh, announced earlier this year the initiation of phase two clinical studies of using encapsulated delivery of cells for the treatment of people with type one diabetes. Their device is shown uh, here on the slide. Additionally, uh, CERNOVA is conducting preclinical testing of an implantable device for the treatment of diabetes. So moving on to patents within the field of cell encapsulation, both devices and methods of treatment are being claimed. On the device side, we have encapsulation devices, perforated semi-permeable devices, 
dispenser devices, and cell encapsulating assemblies. On the method side, we see methods of treating patients, including transplanting um, encapsulated cells, methods for producing mammalian insulin in vivo, which is useful for the treatment of diabetes, and methods for preparing biocompatible compositions and delivering biologically active molecules. So here is an example of a microencapsulation patent assigned to Encapsulite. This patent is directed to immunoisolation microcapsules. It claims an immunoisolation patch for cellular transplantation therapy. The patch includes multi-membrane microcapsules and a biocompatible support matrix. The multi-membrane microcapsules include an inner membrane made of a biocompatible material, as well as an outer membrane, which provides chemical stability to the patch. We can see here that it is important for the patch to be biocompatible, among other things. So here's an example of a macro encapsulation patent assigned to via site. This patent is directed to an immunoisolating device that is capable of encapsulating cells. It claims a device that includes human pancreatic endocrine cells with a, within a semi-permeable membrane. The claim goes on to recite various synthetic materials that the membrane can be made of. We can see here that it is important for the membrane to be semi-permeable to allow for the bidirectional transport of oxygen and insulin. In summary, cell encapsulation technology is promising for the treatment of diseases that require minute-to-minute -minute regulation of metabolites um, and where structures similar to that of the native organ is important, for example, in uh, endocrine disorders. There is active interest in protecting the IP of devices and methods of treatment for cell encapsulation technology. However, the big challenges in this field are getting the technology to work in clinical settings and obtaining FDA approval. As such, the field is open to technological development and accordingly opportunities for patent protection. So uh, now I'll hand it over to my colleague, uh, Steve Mabius. Thanks, Jenny, and uh, hi everybody. I'm Steve Mabius. I'm going to talk today about packaging and delivery of RNA DNA therapeutics. And I'd like to uh, start by pointing out the delivery challenge, which uh, Sean has touched upon and Jenny as well, that the there's been a lot of ups and downs with respect to cell therapeutics, RNA and DNA therapeutics. And I think initially people saw the huge promise uh, that resulted from preclinical work, and then they encountered a lot of challenges in the clinic. And so some of that early exuberance uh, went away, but then more recently we've had some some great breakthrough uh, approvals, including the the mRNA vaccines for COVID. And so I think there's a huge amount of potential. And there's one article that just talked about the roller coaster relationship with RNA therapies, which I put a site to in the slide. And really, what we what we've seen from all the discussion so far is there's really a multi-pronged challenge of how do you get these therapeutics to the right tissue and organs within the body? How can you deliver it safely? And how can you avoid um, too much uh, autoimmune response and still, still get your target therapeutic to where it needs to go? And, and I think what we're seeing now is that the delivery technology itself is becoming as valuable as some of the underlying therapeutics. And it'll be interesting to see whether this creates new opportunities for businesses to separately focus on delivery per se, uh, regardless of what specific therapeutic it, it applies to. So just a few quick milestones with respect to RNA DNA therapy. And in 2017, the first gene therapy was approved uh, for rare vision impairment. In 2018, the first RNAi was approved, uh, Patisiram. And then on December 11, 2020, and December 18, 2020, um, we had the emergency use approval by FDA of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. 
And so what are some of the approaches that are being used to deliver this category of therapeutics? Well, as Sean mentioned, the workhorse so far is lipid-based nanoparticles. There are some other approaches that are, that are being developed uh, that include polymer nanomaterials, for example, PLGA type of depot formulations that can be injected and remain in a specific area and slowly release the active agent, silica nanoparticles, carbon and gold, and then also the, the GALNAC, which targets the liver, has been successfully developed in the case of Givlari. Um, which is a galnac conjugated Cerna therapeutic. So another interesting aspect of RNA therapeutics that impacts the patent strategy is the fact that some are small molecule and are reviewed by the FDA as small molecule, for example, patisiran whereas others are going to be classified as biologics, like the mRNA COVID vaccine. And this will impact the, the strategy around the patents as well as the exclusivity uh, that's available. So, for example, a small molecule can receive five years of new chemical entity exclusivity uh, and in the case of Petisiran, it also received orphan drug exclusivity, whereas biologics will get 12 years of data exclusivity under the BPCIA. And so I think these are worth considering in terms of the fact that you have an orange book for small molecule drugs. You don't have an orange book in the case of biologics. Um, the way that patent strategies can be synchronized with the expiration of data exclusivity is an important issue, and so it's important to think about what type of specific therapeutic you're dealing with. So I wanted to highlight in, in the short time we've, we've allocated for this section one of the important uh, lipid-related patents that is listed in the orange book relating to Petisiran. And first of all, I would just point out that there's you know, plenty of patents available that can be listable in the orange book uh, for a small molecule RNA therapeutic like Petisiran. It has 21 orange book patents listed. Some of them relate to delivery and some relate to the method of use and, and the molecule itself. Um, I've just highlighted one example in this slide of a nanoparticle relating to the lipid delivery approach. And it's a generic claim in the sense that it can have any <clears throat> nucleic acid active agent. It has a cationic lipid in a specific uh, mole percent range. It has a non chiotic cationic lipid comprising a mixture of phospholipid and cholesterol, uh, again, with a mole percent range. And it's got a conjugated lipid that inhibits aggregation of particles, again, in a, in a mole percent range. So this just illustrates that you can obtain a patent and list it in the orange book that recites a formulation of lipids that creates a nanolipid delivery uh, particle for an RNA therapeutic. Another interesting aspect of this is that there have been some inter-parties review challenges filed against RNA delivery patents, uh, including the patent that I just showed on the previous slide. And some of the claims have been invalidated. Some have been upheld. Um, this is similar to other biotech and pharmaceutical IPRs where there are mixed outcomes. But in the case of the specific patent I just showed on the previous slide, the PTAB, at least in its final written decision, upheld patentability of that particular lipid delivery patent, although that 
decision may be subject to appeal. And Moderna had previously sublicensed that patent that ended up dropping the license before the pandemic, uh, which may be the reason that Moderna decided to challenge that particular patent. So I think what this shows is that some of these delivery patents can be quite valuable commercially. And the fact that Al Nylum is a, is a licensee and Moderna at one time was a licensee under the same delivery patent just illustrates that a single delivery patent may be useful to multiple companies who are developing therapeutics. So it's important as part of your patent strategy to think about the extent to which you can capture claims beyond the initial therapeutic you're developing and focus on a patent strategy that includes consideration of the delivery aspects and whether the delivery aspects are separately patentable in their own right apart from the therapeutic itself. And I think this also highlights that parties who are developing new active RNA or DNA therapeutics need to take a careful look at the existing delivery landscape because there may be a number of um, already issued generic uh, formulation delivery patents like the ones assigned to Arbutus that I showed on the previous slide. And as part of the clearance searches that are done and looking at the potential delivery approaches that a company wants to use for a specific new candidate, if you discover that there are potentially blocking patents, you can consider whether to license design around or attack the validity through inter-parties review. And what we've seen is that at least so far, some claims may be upheld, others have been invalidated, and uh, it's, it's going to be important with any patent that's potentially listable in the Orange Book to have lots of fallback positions and make sure that the dependent claims are carefully crafted uh, to cover those fallback positions because there are a significant percentage of claims that end up being found unpatentable when they're challenged in inter-parties reviews. So with that, I'm going to pause and there will be a, a CLE code announced. Thank you. At this time, I will announce the CLE code. For those seeking CLE credit today, please type the following into the box on your screen and hit the submit button. The code is V P P Q F. Again, that is V as in Victor, P as in Paul, P as in Paul, Q as in Quad, and F as in Frank. We will leave the box open briefly. One last time, the CLE code is V P P Q F. And now I will turn it back over to Tenron. So I will be uh, discussing viral vectors. Um, for gene therapy and other therapeutic deliveries. Uh, first of all, I want to provide a you know, brief introduction of some of the notable viral vectors that, are, that has been used in uh, therapeutics. And the first one is adeno-associated viruses, uh, which I think Sean and, and uh, has already uh, briefly discussed. Um, AV vector is basically the go-to vector right now for in vivo applications and you know in, in vivo therapeutics and uh, the two um, gene therapies that has been um, approved by the FDA so far both uses AAV vectors the first one is Luxterna of therapeutics of sparks therapeutics 
which was approved in 2017 for treating an inherited retinal disease associated with RPE65 mutations. And the other one is Zogensma of Novartis, which was approved in 2019 for treating SMA associated with a mutation in the, uh, in the SMN1 gene. And aside from AV vectors, another type of virus vectors um, commonly used is lantiviral vectors. Uh, and because lantiviral vectors uh, can carry a very large payload, uh, it has been used in ex vivo context for purpose of creating uh, ex vivo therapies, including CAR T therapies, uh, as well as therapies for sickle cell diseases. Another um, virus is worth mentioning is, is adenovirus vectors. Um, although adenovirus has been associated with some of the adverse events over 20 years ago in the first generation of gene therapy testings, uh, recently adenovirus has been used as vaccine um, in, in, the, in the context of um, you know, COVID-19 vaccines. And it's notable that uh, the, both the J&J &J and AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccines uses adenovirus. Um, lastly, another viral vector that's worth mentioning is a Sendai viral vector. And it's been used for reprogramming of iPSC cells uh, to create stem cell therapies. It has also been used uh, in the context of vaccines. Uh, the rest of my section will focus on AV vectors uh, because it's, you know, it's the vector uh, of most interest for in vivo applications. And uh, here are some of the advantages and challenges associated with AV vectors. Uh, the advantages including that the AV vectors are generally non-pathogenic and non-integrating. Uh, there are some report of um, genome integrating in event associated with AV delivery. Um, but in general, uh, the frequency of that happening is extremely low compared to other viral vectors. Um, so, in, you know, um, the risk of having an integrating event associated with AV vectors is generally considered outweighed by the uh, benefit of the gene therapy. And another advantage of AV vector is that its tissue tropism is determined by the capsid protein, which is a protein on the surface of the AV vector. So in theory, by um, switching to different capsid proteins or by using an engineered capsid protein, you can redirect the AV vector to target different tissues and organs. Uh, what are the challenges? Um, the number one challenges associated with AV vector is that its payload is relatively small. It's about 4.7 KB, uh, which means if you have a protein that are over, you know, 1500 amino acids, uh, for example, it's going to be challenging to use a single AV vector to deliver that large protein. I mean, uh, to, to deliver coding sequences for that large protein. Uh, there are existing technology um, by which you can basically split a large protein coding sequence into multiple parts and using multiple AV vectors to deliver each part and have them uh, recombine uh, into the target protein inside the cell. But that by itself is, is a challenging uh, task. Um, aside from its payload, um, another challenge associated with AV vector is immunogenicity. Um, because AV vectors are largely isolated from human and non-human private, uh, a fraction of the human population may have pre-existing immunity to a specific AV, um, a specific type of AV vectors. And also, uh, once you have AV vectors delivered, uh, in the context of gene therapy, the, the proteins on the surface of the AV vectors may uh, induce in, an immune response, just like you know, when a human body may have an immune response to a uh, virus, and that may prevent redosing 
of the gene therapy. And another challenge associated with uh, AV vectors is, is tissue tropism um, in the sense that uh, so far there are, are limited um, organs, limited AV vectors that can specifically target a specific target organ or tissues. Um, there are intense research being conducted in this area to expand the tissue tropism of AV vectors and making it more specific. Uh, but so far, it's still a uh, limiting factor. Uh, what are some of the examples of success? Um, as discussed uh, previously, Lux Turner uh, uses a AV2 vector which targets retinal cells uh, for treatment of the inherited uh, retinal disease. Uh, and Zogesma uses a AV9 vector, which specifically targets neurons uh, for treatment of, of SMA. So, uh, so far, the success has been, uh, you know, has involved AV vectors that can target specific tissues and organs. And in the, in the example of Lux Turner, the AV vectors are directly delivered uh, into the eyes which has limited immune surveillance uh, because uh, it's, it's you know, um, blocked from the immune system of the human body. And in the case of Zogesma, uh, there is ongoing research uh, and clinical trials um, trying to apply Zogesma for direct deliver into spinal fluid, thereby bypassing the blood-brain barrier and hopefully you know, uh, reduce uh, the doses of of, of the gene therapy and associated toxicity. Um, here, there are some statistics about patent publications involving AAV. As you can see, uh, United States is still leading the world in terms of patent filings uh, related to AAV vectors. And the patent filing has um, been steadily increasing from as, as far as 2003 all the way to last year. Um, and in terms of top patent filers, uh, most of these uh, uh, universities and, and companies in the United States with the number one patent filer being University of Pennsylvania. Um, I want to also give you some examples of um, patent that has been issued um, with claims covering AV vectors. And um, one type of um, patents that have been, um, that, that have been the core asset in some of these, some of the licensing activities in this field are patents that covers uh, AV vectors per se, and also um, the capsid proteins of AV vectors. And uh, this 111 patent, which was issued to uh, Univers University of Pennsylvania, uh, claims a, a non-naturally occurring AV comprising an AAV night capsid. And this is a, um, a, 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 a patent that had been uh, licensed and sub-licensed to various commercial companies um, in the development of uh, AV nine based gene therapies. And aside from, um, aside from new stereotypes of AV vectors, another area of intense research is the engineering of capsid protein on the um, surface of AV vectors to improve its property. Um, as I discussed a few minutes ago, the two problems with AV vectors, the two challenges with AV vectors is immunogenicity and tissue tropism. And both of these are to some extent determined by the capsid protein on the surface of the AV vectors. So there are a lot of research to uh, modify and engineer the capsid proteins to improve their properties. And one way to do it is by rational design and here is an example in which an AV9 vector capsid protein is being used as a scaffold, and the uh, inventors inserted a, um, 
a targeting a, a peptide that targets conducting airway cells into the scaffold uh, to create a chimeric uh, capsid protein, which is capable of targeting airway epithelial cells. Aside from rational design, um, another way of engineering capsid proteins is by directed evolution, um, which means um, one would use uh, iterative rounds of selection to, um, you know, select a a a, a basically a, a, a selection from randomly mutated capsid proteins to identify a specific mutation that is uh, of interest. And here is an example in which a AV2 vector uh, capsid protein has uh, a random seven-letter amino acid sequence inserted into the capsid protein, and through directed evolution, a specific uh, variant, which is called AV2-7M8, is being identified as specifically targeting retinal and cochlear cells. And another, um, another way of, um, of, of you know, of uh, engineering and modifying uh, and identifying capsid proteins is by in silico computational analysis. Uh, here is one example uh, in which a patent claim is uh, covering a um, specific ancestral viral sequences, which can be used as capsid proteins on AV vectors called ANC18. So aside from the capsid proteins and AV vector itself, um, the core IPs that have been involved in various licensing deals, including patent that covers method of treatment, method of delivery, method of manufacturing, as well as pharmaceutical compositions and formulations. And uh, that concludes my section of the uh, presentation. Okay, it looks like we do have a few questions. Um, the first one, uh, it looks like Jenny might already be answering it, but for the group, I'll, I'll announce it. Regarding patents directed to CART non-encapsulated cells, Jenny mentioned that typically the treatment method is claimed. Couldn't the cells themselves be claimed? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, it is common for the treatment methods to be claimed. And additionally, it's also very common for to have claims directed to uh, the cells. For example, you might have a claim directed to a cell that has an antigen coupler that's encoded by a particular nucleic acid sequence. So even if the, the transmembrane protein, such as CD19, is the same for different CAR T cells, you can have claims directed towards different antigen couplers. So with the CAR-T patent example that I discussed earlier, I wanted to focus on the delivery mechanism or here the container that was holding the CAR-T cells. So thank you for the question. Our next question is for Sean. What major setbacks do you see with greater organ specificity and or higher potency next gen constructs? Will there be major challenges with any of the opportunities ahead? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, it's hard to know exactly when and where uh, another setback will, will occur. This is, uh, you know, actually where we tend to, to learn from and, and advance. Um, I, when it comes to organ-specific delivery, there, there are two routes that we're advancing. One is um, the uh, production of more specific serotypes uh, of, in the case of AAV for a given organ, such as uh, what uh, TR discussed at length. Um, second is direct delivery into the, the organ itself. We have the opportunity to do that with uh, surface level um, organs like the eye or the brain. Um, we have the spinal cord. And I think in the last uh, couple months and years, the, the field has actually been uh, blindsided by some of the challenges that have come up with the direct to uh, organ delivery with, with the case of the eye or, or, or the brain. And 
um, there's a theme here, and, and that theme may help us think about where the next setback could be. And um, whether it's ASOs or RNA, I or, or gene therapy, um, these uh, safety issues tend to crop up where the genetic material gets to uh, an organ or part of the or part of the organ um, that it, where it's not supposed to. So, uh, just to give the brain as a quick example. Um, Zolgensma was delivered um, intravenously uh, for the first approval and uh, did not see any major setbacks. Uh, the FDA, you know, approved that. And now the uh, intrathecally delivered direct to brain Zolgensma is on a clinical hold uh, with the FDA. And the reason for that is when injected into the spine, um, there can be the risk of the, the drug getting to a portion of the, the uh, nervous system called the dorsal root ganglion and causing uh, inflammation and, and issues over there. Um, and so scientists are working on ways to, to get around that, uh, ways to knock down the expression of the gene therapy in the dorsal root ganglion and avoid this uh, risk of, of expression in, in, in an off-target part of the organ. Um, and so ultimately we have to, to uh, wait and see how that bears out. But we need to ensure that uh, genetic material does not get to off-target organs in order to advance organ-specific uh, delivery. And this final question for the group, with the difficulties you highlighted of the appropriately deli appropriate delivery of the active ingredients for these therapies, do you think the patent landscape will eventually evolve into a particularly hard one to traverse for new therapies? Uh, this is Steve. I'll, I'll try to address that and invite uh, my co-presenters to also address it as well. Uh, I think that it's still relatively early days in the delivery space for these new generation of therapeutics so that there's probably a lot of opportunities to innovate around the delivery technology and develop new patent positions and widely license it to all the companies that have candidates in this area. And we've seen at least this one example in the RNA space where Arbutus had licensed its patents to multiple entities. And could it eventually evolve into an area where it's difficult to introduce a new therapy? I don't, my, my own speculative answer on this is that I don't see it evolving into a situation that's any more difficult than existing uh, therapeutics or traditional pharmaceutical small molecule therapeutics. I think there's lots of opportunities for creative deal making, and there's also challenges as far as how you carefully search for patents that may be relevant uh, because you need to think about the search terminology for identifying rele relevant patents. For example, some patents may be claimed in terms of a combination of different polymer types, and people may use different terminology to define the polymers in their formulation. So a, a lot of thought needs to go into how do you conduct a clearance search around the delivery technology and a lot of careful choices need to be made about the search protocols that you employ. Um, but overall, I, I don't anticipate that, that this situation would evolve into one any more difficult than, you know, traditional pharmaceuticals where you do see some separate companies around controlled release technology, for example, and there are opportunities there to establish licensing relationships with companies that have specialized expertise on how to deliver the drugs um, and, and partner with them if you have a new therapeutic but you don't have a delivery technology capable of effectively 
getting an inpatient. So let me pause there and see if anybody else has a comment. One recent example of, of the patent landscape uh, evolving in, in a very uh, tangible way actually is uh, when it comes to the mRNA COVID vaccines in the last uh, few weeks, there's been discussion of um, whether or not uh, a patent waiver would be uh, instituted for the mRNA vaccines. And this is obviously very controversial. Um, it, on, on one hand, uh, patents help protect the, uh, the sales for, for the, the distributors and manufacturers. On the other hand, um, if a patent waiver were to be instituted, that could help bring this very necessary vaccine to, to uh, other countries in, in need. Um, and so uh, per perhaps a little bit different given that it's, um, you know, potentially government regulation here. Um, I thought that was, that was uh, relevant to, to bring up for the audience. Uh, thank you, Sean, Steve, and Jenny, uh, for your excellent presentation today on delivery of cell RNA and DNA therapeutics, uh, which is an extremely active and exciting field. And uh, thanks to everyone who joined the webinar today. Uh, if you have any additional questions, uh, feel free to contact any of us by email or by phone. And uh, this concludes the webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye.